sex education was added to the school curriculum and magazines carried advice on its every aspect. It also spawned a new generation of social workers and psychologists who specialised in nothing else. In the 1980s, the revolution continues, but has it now gone too far? Are the sex educators, counsellors and therapists delving too deeply into a very sensitive area of our private lives? Trevor Watson put that question to Professor Harvey Gocross of the University of Hawaii. Professor Gocross has spent his life researching the subject. The sheer weight, as you call it, of the, uh, the interest in sex has potentially some harmful effects. And those harmful effects are getting people too worried, too preoccupied with, am I doing it right? Am I a good lover? Have I read the right books? Have I taken the right workshops? Am I as good in bed as I should be in bed? Am I doing everything right? It leads to something we call performance anxiety. And that means that every time a person engages in a sexual activity, they're, they're performing, they're acting out a role according to what they have been told is the right way to be. Uh, there's a trend in our field, I think a very good trend, to, to, to avoid the edicts, the rules, the, uh, the instructions, and say, hey, you are you, you have to discover who you are, what gives you pleasure, uh, you can uh, enjoy your own sex life and your, uh, enhance your partner's sex life, don't, don't worry so much about the rules. Worry about being true to yourself, being, uh, be yourself in bed. Australian feminist Jermaine Greer, after helping to lead the 60s revolt, is one of those who has had a slight change of heart. She now bluntly tells parents to leave their children's sex education to their peers and experimentation. Dr Jean Gocross strongly disagrees. Well, I disagree with it rather vigorously. I think we have a tendency to say that we should treat sex as something natural and then we proceed to treat it as unnaturally as possible. And it seems to me that the problem is not that we give too much sex education. In fact, it's not possible to get away without giving sex education. It's a question of whether we do it well or not and whether we're helpful or not. And I think if we were helpful more helpful earlier and more continually, we would be doing a better service to our children than we have been in the past. Jermaine Greer is, uh, to a large extent, uh, riding on the crest of a reaction to the rapid sexual changes of 10, 15 years ago, and many people are today. I think she's picking up what a lot of people feel, and I do think she has the point that we really have gone overboard. There is more to life than orgasms. The sex revolution also gave many homosexuals the confidence to declare themselves and their needs publicly. Others still consider the social stigma too great and choose to hide their sexuality in normal heterosexual marriage. Dr. Gocross is now working on a book to be titled When Husbands Come Out of the Closet. Nobody knows how widespread it is, but there are estimates that 20% of gay men have been married at some time or are married and that now appears to be very very low so that what we've seen of couples where one partner is is gay or bisexual seems to be just the tip of the iceberg and there's a increasing evidence that it's an extremely common situation how do women generally react if we can say generally react when their husband does say well i'm bisexual or i'm gay okay. It depends very much on how they come to learn, what the husband says, how he behaves, what his desires are for the future. If the men come out with what I call a positive disclosure, that is, they're feeling badly about perhaps creating pain for their wives, they're still committed to their wives, they're still committed sexually, they reassure the wives that the wives are sexually satisfying, if there is love and commitment, then it's usually seen as a, as a confirmation of trust, and the wives usually react positively. Can a marriage under those circumstances stay together? Can it succeed at all? Yes, very definitely. And anybody who finds uh, him or herself in this situation needn't panic. Homosexual people are not capable of maintaining relationships of a marital kind with a person of the opposite sex. That is basically what the problem is, if it is a problem. Isn't it possible, though, for a husband and wife in that situation to develop an understanding and to, in fact, develop a sort of love for each other? 
together. And very good friends, yes. And some people have lived together in that situation for many, many years. The point is that I question if that's a marriage or not. What do you think of the morality of a homosexual person marrying a heterosexual person? If, if you're asking me, would it be moral for me to marry, no, it definitely would not. Because I know that I cannot form a relationship with a woman, and therefore if I married her, I would not be giving her uh, that very basic human attribute that I believe marriage should contain. Therefore, marriage for me would be cruel, unethical, and immoral. Why do homosexual people then marry? Um, there's quite a lot of reasons that we have to generalise here. And I must say that in this conversation, we must see it as generalising. But a lot of homosexual people marry because they are pushed into it by their families. A lot of them don't want to be homosexual. They, they fight their homosexuality and they see marriage as a weapon with which to fight their homosexuality. Of course, they can't win. They are homosexual and that's all there is to it. What sort of advice could you give a couple in that situation? I, you really can't generalise. It's not possible to generalise. But if you, if you really want me to stick my neck out, I do think that probably the best thing to do is to separate, suffer the grief of, of, a, of a broken marriage and go through that, and for the a heterosexual person has then got a place in their emotions left to let someone who can fulfil them in marriage, you can start again. Of course, there'll be a need for sex counselling and marriage guidance so long as human beings enter into complex relationships of any sort. But Professor Gocross says that in the 80s, the style is changing. Masters and Johnson gave birth to an era in which a lot of sexual counsellors, therapists, educators became essentially plumbers. They were concerned about the works of the body, how, the, uh, how to overcome erectile problems and orgasmic problems. And that was uh, almost a complete thrust of the sex counselors. Now we're seeing that that had limited effects, really, because you cannot really look at anybody's sexual plumbing without the context of their total se uh, sexual life, emotional life. A word that we're discovering in the uh, field of sex is a word that a lot of people have been using for a long time, and it's a word called love. Trevor Watson reporting on our...